Hello and welcome back to the course on machine learning. Today we're talking about decision trees. All right, let's get started. You might have heard the term CART. It stands for classification and regression trees. And this term is an umbrella term for two types of trees, which are obviously classification trees and regression trees. Now, the difference is that classification trees, they help you classify your data. So they work with categorical variables such as male or female, apple or orange, or different types of colors and variables of that sort. Whereas regression trees, they are designed to help you predict outcomes which can be real numbers. So uh, for instance, the salary of a person or uh, the temperature that's going to be outside and things like that. So those are the two different types and we're going to be talking about classification trees in this section of the course. So here we've got an example with lots of points on our two-dimensional scatter plot. Now, how does a decision tree work? So what it's going to do is cut it up into slices in uh, several iterations. So let's have a look. So there'll be split one, there'll be split two. So split one, split the, our data at x2 equals 60, split two, split our data at x1 equals 50, uh, split three, split our data at x1 equals 70, and split four, split our data at x2. It's not shown here, but it's about 20. So that is how a decision tree works and the basis for these splits. So how are these splits selected? How does uh, the algorithm know where to select the splits? Well, basically, if you have a look at it now, and then the split is done in such a way to maximize the number of a certain category in each of these splits. So to maximize, for instance, we want maximum red categories here. And uh, here it's, it's still the same, but then the next split maximizes the number of green here and the number of red here. Uh, it's a very basic way to explain it. In reality, there's some complex mathematics happening in the background. Uh, the uh, split is trying to minimize entropy. And uh, in, so it's informational entropy. It's a, a very interesting term. Uh, it would take hours and hours and hours for us to go through all of that right now. And uh, so if you want to get into the deeper mathematics behind this algorithm, then you certainly can research that. But for us, it's sufficient that we're just looking for the optimal split or the algorithm is going to find optimal splits that are going to maximize the number of different points in each one of these uh, new pockets, or they're actually called leaves. So you've got the starting scatter plot, and then at the end, you've got these leaves and the final leaves are actually called terminal leaves. So that's how the splits occur. And now let's rewind a bit. And let's do that whole procedure again. But while we're performing the splits, we're going to start constructing a decision tree, an actual decision tree. Let's have a look. So there's our split number one. And what it's doing is it's splitting our data at the 60 level. So now let's construct a decision tree that's going to ask exactly that question. So is x2 greater than 60 or less than 60? So if it's greater than 60, it falls into one branch. If it's less than 60, it'll fall into the next branch. So there we go. X2, is it less than 60 or no? Yes and no. Next is split two, only splits the data that is above 60 in the X2 variable. So let's have a look at that. We're only dealing with uh, data that is above X2. So it's over here. And now we're checking. So I'm going back now. Now we're checking S split two happens at 50 for the X1 variable. So here we go, x1 is less than 50, yes or no. So if, and here you can see that right away, this split already you can tell us whether something is green or red. So if it's uh, less, so if we're already above 60 and then below 50, then it's green, which we can see here. If we are above 50, then it's red, which we can see here. So that's how this classification works. And now let's deal with the remainder. So here we've got a split three happening at 70. If you're below 70, you're obviously going to be red. Otherwise, we're going to need to do another split. So below 70, then it's red. No, we've got to do another split, split four. If it's above 20, then it's green. If it's below 20, then it's red. If it's above 20, then it's green. So that's a no. If it's below, then it's a yes. So with these decision trees, a good way to structure them is to always keep yes, 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 yes on one side. So like if, you, if you're if you looking for yeses, they're always going to the left, looking for no's going to the right or vice versa. So just don't mix them up. And then the terminal leaves will predict exactly what color or what class is left. But at the same time, even if you don't get to the terminal leaf, because this is a very simple tree, trees can be very, very long. And so sometimes you might not even get to the bottom. So if you want to classify a new observation, and for example, this observation falls into this section over here, 
then it would go down this road, then here, and then we go here. But let's say you don't even get to the end, you get to somewhere over here, then in these boxes that don't that have still that still have a mix. So here you can see there's a mix of green and red. Then the rule here is that a probabilistic classification occurs. So here we know uh, instead of checking this last condition, we'll just check what is the likelihood of it being green and red. So here we see that there's more green than red. So if we're just going to leave it at this box, then we'll just say that it's uh, it's a green dot. Whereas if we leave it at this whole box, if we just if we just do this part, so we only go check the first condition and then we leave it here, then we would automatically say that it's a red dot if we don't go down the decision tree and check more conditions. So that's another way of using the decision tree. Instead of going to, down to the very end, you can stop at any point and then just use the probabilities to predict your classification. And another thing is that it doesn't always have to be the two variables. So for instance, in a decision tree, just like with any other machine learning algorithm, you can have a multi-dimensional data set, which has lots of different columns. So in our case, we only have two, but you might have lots and lots of columns, and then you could have a mix of questions being asked here. And that's up to the algorithm to come up with those questions. And as a final note, I wanted to mention a little bit about the history of decision trees. Decision trees have been around for a very, very long time. And in fact, they are so old that they have recently kind of started to die off. They were still popular about 20, 30 years ago, but recently more sophisticated methods have come to replace them and decision trees stopped being so popular. And that's continued for a while until recently they were reborn with new upgrades, so to speak. And those upgrades are additional methods that build on top of decision trees and such methods are random forest, gradient boosting, and other methods. And in this part of the course, we'll look at least at one of those other methods. The point is that decision trees are, though a very simple tool, they aren't very powerful on their own, but they're used in other methods that leverage their simplicity and create some very powerful machine learning algorithms. And such algorithms even are used to perform facial recognition, like on your iPhone, you get uh, you have facial recognition, and also some games such as Kinect, which is kind of like the Wii, but uh, you can play it without actually holding a controller. So it's like a game for your addition to your Xbox, and you can play it without having a controller in your hand. So it kind of recognizes where you're moving your arms and legs and that method, Microsoft decided to use random forests for that method and random forests invoke decision trees. So hopefully you enjoyed this today's tutorial. It is quite a simple method, but at the same time, it lies in the foundation of some of the more modern and more powerful methods in machine learning. I look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, enjoy machine learning.